I'm scared of dying, but I'm scared of living. Cause every time I talk, I hurt somebody's feelings. Oh, when I'm craving you. <laughs> Good day. Welcome back to Inside, Inside the Ultiverse. With your host today, Mr. Thomas Henley. Do you ever feel lonely, but at the same time struggle to socialise? You get filled with that sense of social anxiety, perhaps the places that your friends like to go and hang out at, or particularly quite sensory environments, a lot of busyness, a lot of noises and lights, and it's not really your vibe, but you really need that sense of community, you need that sense of friendship, you want a relationship, you want to be able to be around other human beings, interact with them, and make yourself feel good. Here's a newsflash that a lot of people need to know, and probably even myself, when I was a wee boy, needed to know. Autistic people, although we tend to be a little bit more on the introverted side, and tend to struggle with the sort of social communicational aspects of life, it does not necessarily mean that we don't require social interaction. Most human beings, the majority of the human race, require some level of social interaction to live a healthy life. In fact, loneliness is one of the biggest driver of negative health factors alongside all the common culprits that you can think of. So today we're going to be diving into the fine art of balancing your sanity with loneliness. And for any of you out there who are thinking, oh my god, Tom, what are you talking about? I would love to, I would love to socialise, but I'm just really struggling to, like, find friends, to find people. I relate to that. It's taken me a long time to try and find some people that I really get on with, and even more of a long time finding people within my local area that I can hang out with, do all those friend-related things. And most of my social battery is made up from calling people, video chats, audio chats. A lot of my friends are remote all over the globe, and it's really hard to find people who you really vibe with and really get on with in your local area. But putting that fact aside for a second, I think there is a valuable conversation to be had around actually like balancing having friends, balancing having a relationship with your own sanity, your own social battery, your own well-being as an autistic person. Striking balances is something that many humans have to do in life, but for autistic people there seems to be a lot of cases where it's taking the lesser of two evils, or trying to find the middle path through things. It's similar to balancing depression and anxiety for me. For me, if I don't get outside, I don't do a lot of things, my anxiety tends to be a lot lower, because I'm in my safe space, I'm feeling quite relaxed, but my depression tends to get worse, because I'm not going out into the world, I'm not sort of exiting my, my little cubby hole and entering into the big wide world to socialise to, or even just to generally be around people in public. But if I do too much of it, and I'm out there too much, and I'm having too many new experiences, and I'm doing too many things, my anxiety tends to skyrocket. And it puts me at risk for having meltdowns, shutdowns, panic attacks, all of those things. In the case of loneliness, for you, it may be this feeling of, of sort of agoraphobia. The fear of sort of being in big spaces, wide open spaces, being outside of your house, that might be something that you feel quite a lot. Or maybe you have some level of social anxiety about interacting with people outside or just being in the presence, being in the, in the presence of people in public. Balancing that with feelings of loneliness can be quite hard, especially if you don't know anybody in the first place. And you're, you're trying to go out and you're trying to make friends, it kind of adds a new dimension of not really knowing what you're getting yourself into. The reason why this can be such an issue for a lot of autistic people is related to this idea or this concept of the social battery. Meaning everybody during their week, during their day, during at any point will have a certain social battery. Some people who are highly extroverted, who just love to be around people all the time, maybe that social battery is like always full and the recharge rate on that social battery is much higher than the expenditure that they do when socialising with people. For autistic people like myself, and maybe like yourself, that battery might have a little bit lower of a capacity. 
perhaps maybe half the capacity, or perhaps that social battery might drain a lot quicker than most other people. It might drain a lot quicker due to aspects of sensory inputs, you know, no noisy, busy environments. Could be things related to social differences and perhaps even to a certain degree masking because social communication does require your brain to, to, to be active, especially when you're interacting with people who aren't autistic. And if you are masking as well as trying to pay attention to a conversation, you're also paying attention to how you're appearing in your body language and your facial expressions and you're trying to understand other people's indirect communication and you're trying to remember all of these different factors as well as paying attention and communicating with someone else, you can imagine that it's going to tax your social battery, your overall energy levels, from being in that situation for a long period of time. Or even a short period of time. Autistic people on average tend to experience a lot more mental illness than our neurotypical counterparts, which may also contribute to the level of energy that we have, to the amount of stress tolerance that we have for those busy, sort of chaotic environments. And aspects like depression might have an impact on the social reward that we feel. The pleasant feeling of, of, of happiness or joy or fulfillment or connection from interacting with other people may be more blunted than most others. And so the actual reward in comparison to the amount of energy, the amount of stress that you've got to go through to get that socialising, might not be high enough for you to consider it as often as you probably should. I think there's been some studies particularly on oxytocin in autistic people. Oxytocin is this kind of bonding, love-related chemical. They've done, they've done some crazy tests on like the action of oxytocin within different sort of animals, more promiscuous animals and more sort of bonding one-to-one -one partner animals. It's really interesting. And for autistic people, this inherent sort of social reward, this kind of oxytocin release, might be a lot lower too. So you combine depression, anxiety, autism into one big mix and mess, maybe a bit of social anxiety and agoraphobia. And it's it's really difficult to motivate yourself to to go out there and make friends, find friends, <laughs> socialize with people. Because the, the amount of burden that it puts on your brain, the amount of stress that that situation offers you in your head, just hardly ever matches up with the amount of reward that you feel from doing that thing, even if it will be helpful and healthy for you in the long term. Alongside similar lines to the social battery, managing people, sort of watering the plants, managing friendships can be something that we can find quite difficult. A lot of the time people have varying degrees of neediness. I'm not saying neediness in like always a negative way, but varying degrees of neediness for interaction with people that they're close to. For autistic people, because of our lowered social battery, we might hinge a little bit more towards that side of avoidance. It may not even be avoidance in the typical sense that we're trying to make distance from other people to keep ourselves safe. That might be a factor in the personalities of some people, and it has been for me. But also, we don't tend to need as much socialising or want to have as much socialising due to our introverted nature. And not all autistic people are introverted. I actually sit somewhere in the middle. I'm kind of like an ambivert, bit of mix of both. But due to the things like our social battery, our, our tolerance for stress, all of these other factors that in our lives that we've got to balance, all of this time that we have available that we want to spend on our special interests, sort of alone, and, and also related to our routine. Um, routines are best done, best served in isolation. You can set yourself up a routine independently, but as soon as you try to insert other people into that routine, there's the, there tends to be, at least sometimes... <laughs> if not quite often, those plan changes can definitely impact the overall functioning of your routine and make you feel very anxious and uncertain. Sadly, I've lost many friends and even some potential relationship prospects just by this mismatch in the amount of time that I want to spend texting somebody and the amount of time that they want me to text them. I found, particularly in romantic relationships, people expect interaction to sort of accumulate over time. 
starts off very low and then as as the sort of relationship progresses they want more and more interaction from you they want to see you more they want to text you more they want to call you more and for me there is a limit to that there's like there's a little bit of a there's a ceiling there i can go past that ceiling and actually do that but it, it tends to leave me feeling very resentful that they have such like a negative impact on my overall functioning because it impacts my routine. Um, my social batteries is constantly depleted, so I can't see other people. It makes life a lot, a lot more difficult for me. And when I was younger, I tend to kind of go with it and I just let this happen. But in adulthood, now that I, I want, I have to sort of manage these these different aspects of my life. I have to self advocate a lot more for what kind of communication I need. Now this isn't to say, okay, let's just pander to this to the autistic brain in all of these circumstances. There is sometimes like middle grounds to strike and there can be a lot of use in having a conversation about what level of interaction a person would want. Some people are very happy to have that conversation and try and find that middle ground. Other people not so much. They kind of feel a bit weird about it, asking for for time like your time, your communication directly, what they would want. But some people do. Another really big factor with this whole isolation social battery dynamic is just in general, autistic people's experience with isolation and exclusion. A lot of us coming up through the school system and even through the university and into work, we're sort of in these closed social networks and we can have a lot of negative experiences or a lot of people making judgments about us throughout our entire lives, which may distort our own self-image, may make our self-esteem a lot lower than average, may make us feel quite apprehensive about letting people into our lives, about trusting people. These are all things that we can experience. When you exist in this state and you haven't processed these feelings and thoughts and you haven't kind of progressed and, and moved past this 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 kind of mindset about who you are and and how you what what you're like and how much value you have in comparison to other people it can make it really really difficult to go out there and find friends to maintain friends because you're always thinking about okay at what point are they going to leave at what point are they going to ditch me at what point are they going to take advantage of me it's not good to be in that state and this isn't saying just to never think about that stuff like definitely learn to pick up the red flags, but I think there is a conversation to be had about um, trusting people and allowing yourself to trust people, and allowing yourself to be open and let people in, but also asserting boundaries when they cross them. Um, when you when they cross your boundaries, you self advocate. When they cross your boundaries, you you put something in place to let them know that this is not okay. And you also keep it in the back of your mind and you're like, you're aware of it. A lot of people have different tolerances for crossing these boundaries, for for upsetting them. Some people just, just let it go all the time, you know, they're just, they're a bit bit more of the kind of people pleasery kind of, you know, walk over me kind of types. Not not to be offensive in any way, because I, I was like that for a long time. And other people, as soon as you do anything wrong, and even if you don't do anything wrong, they they will find something that you've done wrong, something to be upset at. And I'll just put a boundary in and they'll just kick you out. Some people are just like that. And I think that's one of the difficulties when it comes to social interaction as an autistic person, because there is no particular rule book, because the rule book changes, the way of navigating a situation changes depending on who you're talking to, to the point where sometimes you're just so mis mismatched with someone else's personality that harvesting any sense of friendship or relationship is just a lose-lose situation and it requires you to extensively mask. So let's have a look at some of the, the tips that I have for balancing this, this sanity or social battery with these feelings of loneliness. You have to remember that this is going to vary a lot person to person and it's also going to vary a lot depending on what mental state you're in. If you are in a very, very low state at the moment, if you have very, very high anxiety at the moment, perhaps the amount of social interaction that you can handle might be a bit lower. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to interact with others, that you shouldn't go to things, that you shouldn't organize with things with other people. It just means that you have to be a bit more cognizant about 
the breaks that you take, the amount of time that you spend, where you go to actually socialize, what sensory supports you use to cope with any any said environment. These are tips specifically for if you already have a friendship, if you already have a relationship, a network around you, we will be going into some tips for if you don't after. Sensory supports is, is definitely a big one. You can also go somewhere that's quite quiet. You can go somewhere that's quite familiar to you. Any sense of certainty tends to help a lot with anxiety. If you are in a very, very low place, or you just can't fit anything into your routine, consider having a phone call, doing a video chat if you find phone calls difficult like me, or even texting somebody. Going a little bit further, you could have one-to-one -one chats with people as opposed to going out in groups. And as I said, when it comes to texting, when it comes to this idea of like watering the plant, having a conversation with someone, explaining the impacts of constant communication on your overall social battery, your mental health, your routine. A lot of autistic people have a monotropic focus style, meaning that we need to spend lots and lots of time focusing on one thing that kind of makes us happy. Um, it's 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 more more key for us to to have a productive workday. And if you are monotropic, having to be distracted constantly to text somebody back and and call somebody in in your break, it kind of breaks up that flow and. God forbid, like, you spend all day talking to people in, like, a customer service role, and then your partner or your friend wants to call you on your break. That's like, my God, you, you really do need some time to relax. And being able to help the other person understand what life is like for you and try and find a middle ground in the, t the amount or the, the style of communication that you two have, I think is a worthwhile thing to do, even if the majority of people might not be too keen on the idea. That's kind of one of the annoying things about self-advocating about being autistic because not everybody wants to hear it. <laughs> not everybody wants to have conversations like this because it's not something that they're used to. It's something that feels a bit weird and off and, oh my God, I, I've got to ask you for how much time I want from you. You know, people can have a variety of different responses and I'd say just try and play it based on what your relationship with that person is like. So what about making friends? If you are in a highly anxious, highly depressed state, you haven't been socializing for a long time, I'd really encourage these things. Number one, if you are going to meet someone new, make sure that it's in an environment that you're used to. If you are going to an environment that's new to you, some place that you don't know, try and go with somebody that you know. This tip has been absolutely life-changing for me, engaging in social interaction. Usually, if I go to places that I don't know with people that I don't know, it can cause me a lot of anxiety. I've had lots of messy, difficult situations where I've done that. I've gone out in a place that I don't know. I don't know how to get home from with people that I don't know. And it's gone sour and I need to get home and I've had a lot of difficulties in situations like that. So making sure that you know a place, it kind of fills you with a sense of certainty about what that place is going to be like and allows you to focus a bit more on handling the aspect of like seeing someone new, talking to someone new. If you're wondering about where to start, I have some suggestions on things that you can do. I'd say that the, the biggest one that I'd put high up on the list is join a club. Pick up a hobby, something that you like. And if you can't find anything that you like, can't find anything that you want to do, that you want to spend your time doing and you prefer to do on your own, try and find something which may attract people who are like-minded. So for example, you might be a person who really enjoys video games. You might want to go check out a board, board club, a board game club. They, those might attract people that you like. You might want to try out a card shop. You might want to pick up some like model figurines or something. Just think of the person who would, who you would like to be friends with, the type of person that you'd like to be friends with, whether it's someone who's like really, really extroverted and loves to party and all that, or someone who likes to kind of chill, read books and play video games and play board games and stuff. Think of those people and think about the things that they would want to do and try and go to clubs, try and pick up hobbies which cover that because you'll have a lot more opportunities to find people who might be a lot more like-minded to you 
might get on with you easier. And you may not even have to do all of this messing about trying to like communicate what your needs are because they might just get it. You might find someone else who's autistic who just kind of vibes with you and it's just easy and, and, and slick. But the, the problem is, is especially if you are coming out of the school system or you have had a tough time with friends or, or finding relationships or your life, you're going to kind of feel, feel it's kind of how this, this, this sort of negative bias on what most people are like. Sure, you may not get in with the majority of people, but in your head, it's like one in a million. So every time that you meet somebody who you get on with, someone who's like-minded, you might put all your eggs in that ba that basket and put all your energy into that and your emotional and 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 everything into that because you're like you're hopeful because you're like oh this is one in a million. It's kind of this this sense of like a, the scarcity mindset to a certain degree, and that's a good way of pushing people away because <laughs> to a lot of people that comes across as quite intense even though it means a lot to you to find someone that you like they may have a, a lot of experience they may have friends they may have other people they may have commitments and coming on that strong to a lot of people can be a bit of a turn off when it comes to not necessarily like relationships but i mean yeah but i think also related to friendships as well like you don't want to be hounded 24 7 by someone that you just met at a hobby club about coming over and socializing with them three days a week and texting them every night you know you've got to take these things slow and you've got to assess and you've got to you've got to see what that other person's level of interaction is like with you because ideally you want to get into a situation where it's kind of like a 50 50 thing you both want to see each other it's it's kind of a natural thing that progresses because you're both interested in spending more time with each other that doesn't mean never ask them to do something never ask them to go you can you can offer and you can say oh i'm thinking about going here do you want to come with but just remembering that even if they say no <laughs> they might say yes to another thing or they might invite you to another thing if you find that you're constantly trying to bide for their attention perhaps it might be best to try and focus your energy somewhere else. You could also try autism support groups. It's not something that I've tried myself, but I've heard other people. I think it really varies on the efficacy, the, sort of the efficacy of joining autism support groups. You can find people that, that are autistic, but you may not vibe with them very much, even if they are autistic. You can try it. You can try even online groups. You can join communities. You can talk to other people. That can sometimes be a good way of meeting some of your social needs, especially if you're struggling to find that in person. But you can also volunteer. You don't really need to do a hobby. If you have some free time, if you have a cause that you really care about and, and think about, consider volunteering because volunteering tends to attract a lot of people who are quite kind, you know, who perhaps might not be as judgmental as your average person, who might just be somebody who's who's open and, and who, who won't make those kind of thin slice judgments that a lot of people make about autistic people. Consider doing something like that because along the side of sort of bolstering your CV and giving you life experience and making you feel all nice and warm for contributing to the world and doing good for other people, you might find someone who you really get on with who is a really kind and great friend or will be a very kind and great friend. I really want to highlight this because I think this is a really, really key thing when it comes to dating, when it comes to friendships. You need to view life, you need to view other people as being on an even, even playing field to you. This doesn't mean disrespect people. This doesn't mean um, like... Put, put people down in order to bring them to your level or or do the opposite and put yourself down to bring yourself to their level, that kind of thing. I'm talking specifically about not putting people on a pedestal, not like thinking to yourself, oh my God, how are they talking to me? Why are they talking to me? But also not thinking, oh, I don't necessarily want to give my attention to this person. They seem, they don't seem, seem of the right caliber for me, you know. You're not having an ego about it but you're also not putting people on a pedestal. When you do that, there is a higher likelihood to develop an even relationship, to develop a 50-50 relationship with that person. It stops you from getting into that scarcity mindset where you think constantly and you, you act as if that person is one in a million, even if you've just met them. 
and it also kind of grounds you a little bit. <laughs> I think for, for for some people, even if they are very high achievers in in your rise, they might they might have some kind of accolade that kind of makes them stand out from the crowd. I think you'll find that most people just want to be talked to as if they are just a regular old human being. Someone that you can just have a chat with, someone who's kind of a bit more down to earth. Some people can be fairly sort of egotistical, but those people tend to be few and far between in my experience, especially if you are trying to trying to sort of optimize your, your friendship game to go to places that people who are like-minded might go to. Other tips might be show an interest in other people, smile, <laughs> Try and, you know, have be polite, have manners, soft it if you're a very blunt person and you tend to kind of blurt things out. Try learn some softeners, especially for people who are strangers. Doesn't mean mask, it doesn't mean hide your true self, doesn't mean start being indirect, but I think sometimes throwing in a few softeners can definitely um, make you a lot more approachable, make you a lot more friendly in the eyes of a lot of people. An example of a softener might be, you see a six foot, Free man from not from North Yorkshire and he's is dressed in all black and he's got these spiky chained goth shoes on and you're like, oh, those are some pretty inappropriate, crazy shoes. Instead of saying that, instead of sort of flirting that, you could say, Oh, those 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 shoes are quite they're quite eccentric, they're quite um quirky, different. You're not necessarily being indirect, but you'd be softening the language a little bit. Sometimes just doing little things like that can go a long way, especially if you tend to be a very direct speaker and you like to be very honest and you like to be very upfront. It's definitely a good quality. I just think for the majority of people, if especially if you're meeting someone in the first instant, learning to use some softeners for things like that can go a long way in making you feel sort of look and, and feel more approachable to other people. And don't put pressure on yourself to be an extrovert. It's okay to be introverted. Not everybody wants to be around people who are very extroverted, who are kind of the life of the party, who sort of have a crowd of people around them, they're sort of interacting and speaking to a large group of people. Some people don't like that. <laughs> I think you'll find, like, I've been to many house parties, gatherings, where there's been people like that who are fairly extroverted. They tend to be by themselves, and the other people who are perhaps a little bit more reserved, perhaps a bit more introverted, tend to kind of sit by themselves and have, like, one-to-one -one chats about different things. You don't necessarily have to put pressure on yourself to always speak, to always fill the silence, to be extroverted, to put on a show in order to show how good 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 potential you have as a friend. Some people like people who are quieter. They like people who are listeners. A lot of people like listener types. It's just about finding the people who are right for you. The people you like and the people who like you. And just be yourself. And don't put pressure on yourself to reach some like especially if you're a guy and you've watched a lot of YouTube, reach these like alpha male kind of sigma male archetypes and sort of work the room and dominate the room or anything like that. You don't need to do that. And to be honest, a lot of people just interpret that as you being an arsehole. Do I have all the answers to this loneliness issue, to balancing out social battery of loneliness? No. Uh, but I, I have had a lot of experience with people both autistic and neurotypical. Uh, I've had friends, I've had relationships and these are some things that I would really have liked to share to myself when I was younger. If you already have a social circle I hope this has helped with giving you some ideas on how to self-advocate and how to manage different relationships alongside different things in your life and your social battery and anxiety and if you are struggling to find friends and you're wanting to find friends I hope that some of these tips have been helpful to you too.